Hello everyone, my name is Thierry Simon and in this presentation I will talk about FRIT, an authenticated encryption scheme with built-in fault detection. Uh, this is a joint work with Leila Batina, Johan Dahmen, Vincent Grosso, Pedro Mat Costa Masolino, Costas Papadianopoulos, Francesco Regazzoni and Nils Samuel. Let me start this presentation by giving you some motivation for our work. Today there is an increasing interest about lightweight cryptography, as is illustrated by the recent NIST lightweight competition, for example. Um, this rising interest can be understood in today's world, where we observe an ever-increasing number of small connected devices. Those devices often operate in an hostile environment where they might be subject to side channel of fault attacks. And we wanted to address this second type of attacks in particular by coming up with a lightweight cryptographic primitive that would integrate some fault detection. More specifically, we wanted to do that using an error detecting code. Um, using error detecting code in cryptography is not a particularly new idea, and in 2016, for example, Schneider et al. proposed a party, which is a hardware countermeasure against side channel and fault attacks that combine a threshold implementation with some error detecting code. Another example for that is that no later than last year, Bayer Le et al. proposed a craft, which is a tweakable block cipher that can be adapted to different uh, error detecting codes. Now, while using error detecting codes is not a particularly new idea, our contribution uh, lies in the fact that uh, with Frit, we designed a lightweight cryptographic permutation that could be efficiently adapted to a specific error detecting code by uh, choosing uh, appropriate building blocks. In the first part of this presentation, we will talk about the generic strategy that we use to design a permutation for a specific error detecting code. And in the second part, uh, we will see together a concrete example for that with Frit. The error detecting code that we used for our permutation is the parity code 432. It maps any 3-bit message uh, to a 4-bit value that has the even parity. In other words, this 4-bit value that we will denote with A, B, C, D must satisfy the parity equation X or B, X or C, X or D equals 0. In order to um, encode a message A, B, C, you just then need to add to it a force bit d equal to x or b x or c. And on the other hand, to decode a 4 bit value a b c d, you just map it to a b c if a b c d is a valid code word, meaning that it satisfies the parity equation. And if it is not a valid code word, then an error is returned. Now, how do we use the parity code in order to build? a fault detecting permutation. Well, let's imagine that we have pi, a 384-bit permutation. Then its state can be divided into three 128-bit um, blocks that we will call limbs, A, B, C. We can then, uh, by adding one extra limb, uh, extend pi into pi bar, a 512-bit permutation that satisfies um, two different properties. The first property that pi bar needs to satisfy is that it preserves the parity. By definition, that means that the input of pi bar satisfies the parity equation if and only if its output satisfies it as well. In the context of permutation, we will often abuse the term code word in order to designate a state that satisfies the parity equation. And with that convention, this property can be rephrased as uh, pi bar must map code words to code words and non-code words to non-code words. If this is the case, then we will say that pi bar abides the parity code. The second property that pi bar needs to satisfy is that it extends pi. Um, and by that we will mean that the restriction of the output of pi bar to the first three limbs must coincide with the output of pi. If this is the case, then we will say that pi is the embedding of pi bar by the parity code. Now, in order to compute pi of a, b, c, we will proceed uh, the following way. 
First, we will initialize the parity limb D as D equals A co X or B X or C. Then we will compute pi bar of A, B, C, D. And finally, we will verify whether the output A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime verifies the parity equation or not. If no fault occur, if no fault occurs, then uh, by the parity preserving uh, property, we know that the output must satisfy the uh, parity equation. And in that case, we also know by the, ex by the uh, extension property that a prime, b prime, c prime must be the output of pi of abc, which is what we wanted to compute in the first place. On the other hand, um, if the parity uh, equation is not satisfied by the output, we know by the parity preserving property that a fault must have occurred. And this is how we detect faults. So far, we've seen together how to detect faults, provided that we can extend a permutation into a code abiding permutation. Uh, but the missing information that we still need to address is how do we concretely build such an extension? And the way to proceed is as follows. So we will split the permutation pi into a sequence of step functions that can be of two forms. So the first type of step function that we will consider will uh, modify a single limb by XORing uh, to it uh, a function phi of the state. The second type of step functions simply consists in swapping two limbs. The reason why we choose such step functions is that they can be efficiently extended into a code abiding step function. And the first method to do that, which is also the most generic one and can always be used, is called limb adaptation. Limb adaptation consists in recomputing phi a second time and adapting the parity limb by adding the output of phi to it. Uh, in this method, it's very important that phi is not computed only once, but really twice independently. Because if this is not the case, a fault injected in the computation of phi will lead to the same faulty outputs being added to two different limbs, which would then compensate when uh, adding the limbs together in the parity equation. The limb adaptation has a performance overhead of 100%, and while it might not seem great, as it is the same as simply duplicating the step function, for example, it has the advantage that the size of the state is only increased by a third instead of being doubled. But where we really gain in terms of performance is by extending a step function using the limb transposition method. A limb transposition is just a reordering of the limbs in the code abiding permutation. This is what happens, uh, for example, when a step function replaces one limb by the sum of the others. Since the parity limb D already contains um, the sum of the other limbs, one can simply swap the limb to be modified with the parity limb in order to extend this step. And this is what we call a non-native limb transposition and is particularly interesting because um, it can basically be implemented for free in the code abiding permutation while it costs two XORs um, in the original permutation. Note also that this uh, method is highly dependent on the error detecting code that we chose uh, for our permutation. Besides non-native limb transposition, we also have uh, a native limb transposition which is based on the observation that swapping two limbs does not uh, affect the state, uh, the parity of the state. Uh, in such case, the parity in D does not need to be adapted. What kind of faults can we hope to uh, detect with the code abiding permutation? Well, obviously we will detect any fault that breaks the parity equation, uh, but more precisely, we are, guaranteed, we are guaranteed to detect any single limb fault, uh, which is the term that we use for a fault that affects only one limb. The code abiding permutation, however, might not detect every possible uh, simple fault. Uh, for example, it will not detect a fault that will flip uh, two bits at the same position in two different limbs, since the parity equation 
uh, will still be satisfied. Now, whether such a fault can indeed occur or not highly depends on the architecture and the implementation. And in order to avoid such faults, uh, one should try to uh, separate the different limbs as much as possible in the implementation. Uh, for example, by storing them into different registers. The code abiding permutation might also not um, detect multiple faults. Uh, for example, when the same exact fault is injected in the two computations of phi during a limb adaptation. Um, however, injecting multiple compensating faults requires for the attacker to have very precise control on the effect of the fault it injects. And if this is not the case, then multiple random uh, faults are very, very much likely to break the parity equation and thus be detected. Um, yeah. On a side note, uh, our model does not, inc does not take into account uh, faults that affect the verification of the parity equation. Uh, but uh, of course, these faults need also to be uh, treated carefully. One last observation that I would like to make is that verifying the parity equation after each step function is not needed. Um, indeed, if a fault occurs during a step function that breaks the parity equation, and if no other fault uh, happens afterwards, then by the parity preserving property, we know that the output of the subsequent step functions will also not uh, verify the parity equation. That is to say that a single check of the parity equation at the very end of the permutation is enough to uh, detect any single limb fault. Um, I would even argue that uh, checking the parity equation more than once at the very end of the permutation is not really worth it. Um, it has a cost in terms of performance, uh, but it does not bring much in terms of additional fault detection capabilities. Um, indeed, the only reason why you would want to check the parity equation more often would be to detect, for example, multiple compensating faults over different step functions. Um, but in our opinion, if an attacker is able to pull that off, he would also be able to inject multiple compensating faults in the same uh, step function, for example, which would not be detected uh, anyway. In the first part of the presentation, we talked about how to design a code abiding permutation. We will now give a concrete example for that with FRIT. So what is FRIT? Uh, FRIT is actually the Dutch word for French fries. Some other people think it also stands for fault resistant iterative extended transformation, uh, but personally I like the first explanation much better. Jokes aside though, FRIT is an authenticated encryption scheme based on the duplex construction in sponge wrap mode. Its underlying cryptographic permutation is called FRIT-PC and has a state of 384 bits. Uh, this is the permutation that we study when we want to know more about the cryptographic properties of the scheme. But uh, the actual permutation that we implemented is rather its code abiding variant, FRIT the underlying cryptographic uh, permutation FRIT-PC has a state that can be divided into three 128-bit limbs, ABC. It counts 24 rounds, uh, each of them divided into six steps. The first step of the round is delta. It consists in adding a round constant to uh, limb C. Um, the round also contains two transpositions, TO1 and TO2, where one of the limb is replaced by the sum of the limbs. Uh, combined in the case of TO1 with some limb permutation. These operations help uh, achieving uh, faster diffusion by mixing uh, the bits between the limbs. The round function also contains two mixing steps, mu1 and mu2, where the circular shift of one limb by some offset is added to another limb. Um, this operation also helps achieving diffusion by mixing uh, bits between the limbs uh, this time uh, at different positions. The last operation of the round is XI. It is the only nonlinear operation and it adds to uh, limb A 
the uh, bitwise end of the circular shift of uh, limp B and limp C by some offsets. All the circular shift, shift offsets in the round functions were chosen in order to achieve a faster diffusion. Using the strategy that we described before, one can extend thread PC into the code abiding permutation thread P. Um, as you can see in the diagram here, the step functions delta, mu, and xi uh, were extended using the limb adaptation technique. Um, yeah, basically, you just need to recompute the step function a second time in order to adapt the parity limb. The step functions uh, TO1 and TO2, on the other hand, were, were extended using the limb transposition technique, and it results in a single step TO at the end of the code abiding permutation, uh, which is just a permutation of the limbs. What is interesting to do here is to compare the number of um, bitwise operations between uh, one round of the two uh, permutations. So you can, for example, notice that the number of a circular shift double uh, going, from one, uh, going from 4 to 8, and it's also the case for the number of bitwise n going from 1 to 2, while the number of uh, exclusive or, on the other hand, uh, remain constant and equal to uh, 8. In order to evaluate the cost of uh, our countermeasure, we implemented it both in hardware and in software. In the following table, you can find um, ASIC performances for different configurations of FRIT. So here FRIT C stands for FRIT Compact, which is just um, FRIT but with the non uh, code abiding permutation. We have one configuration one configuration where we compute one round per uh, clock cycle, and one configuration where we compute two rounds per clock cycles. Um, in this table, we also compare FRIT with uh, Ketje Senior, which is an authenticated encryption scheme that was submitted to the CESAR competition and that has a quite efficient uh, hardware implementation. Uh, you can notice that uh, a round of uh, compact fit is actually a bit lighter than one round of uh, KGS Senior, which translates in 27% um, less area being used uh, for about 20% uh, 20, uh, 20 uh, less power consumption in the uh, one round per cycle version. Both area and power consumption are quite similar when comparing uh, Gadget Senior with Freed instead. Uh, the biggest difference between the two lies in the throughput, but this gap can be explained by the fact that Gadget Senior processes uh, 32 bits uh, of input per round, while Freed only processes 128 bits per 24 rounds. Computing two rounds of uh, Freed per uh, clock cycle uh, costs about um, between 20 and 30 percent uh, more uh, area for only a marginal increase in power consumption. Uh, and finally, um, implementing the code abiding permutation instead of the non code abiding permutation results in uh, about 23 percent more area being used for uh, about 29 percent more power consumption. We also implemented uh, both Frit P and Frit PC uh, on ARM Cortex M4, and we tried to optimize this uh, implementation for speed by using a bit interleaved representation of the state. In the table here, we compared uh, Frit, the performance results for Frit with uh, Zudu and Gimli, which are permutations that are used by two of the second round. Uh, candidates for the NIST lightweight competitions. There are two points that I want to make uh, in this uh, slide. Um, the first one being that uh, first Frit P offers performances that are uh, quite competitive with Zudu and Gimli. So if you look at the cycles per byte result, for example, uh, Frit P is nearly twice as slow as Zudu, but only about 11% slower than Gimli. And you have to keep in mind that um, Frit P actually offers some full detection capabilities 
which is not the case uh, for the other permutations. The other point that I want to make is that uh, implementing the code abiding permutation instead of the non-code abiding one uh, results in a 36% overhead. But actually the main reason for this uh, slowdown is due to the fact that we needed to um, use additional load and store instructions because the 512 bit state of thread P would not fit into the 14 uh, available uh, internal registers of the Cortex M4. In order to validate the fault detection capabilities of our permutation, we did two experiments. Uh, the first experiment is more of a sanity check and consisted in injecting single bit uh, glitches into a simulated hardware implementation of FreeP. Uh, we injected them both at the RTL level but also after synthesis and this experiment resulted in all the injected faults being detected. In the second experiment, we injected electromagnetic faults uh, on a single round implementation of FreeP on ARM Cortex M4. Uh, we divided the chip as a 100 by 100 uh, grid and we injected 10 faults uh, per position uh, for each of the 10 grid scans. Uh, this resulted in 1 million glitches and in about 86% uh, of the uh, cases uh, we could not see any uh, visible effect, so basically we only received the expected output. In nearly 14% of the cases, the glitches were too much for the chip to handle, and the chip went into reset mode. Uh, all in all, there were only 596 uh, cases in which uh, the output was modified, but in all of those cases, the parity uh, check was able to detect the fault. To conclude, uh, in this presentation we saw a new design approach for uh, cryptographic primitives that consisted in choosing appropriate building blocks that could be efficiently adapted to abide a specific error detecting code. We saw a concrete example for that with FRIT for the uh, parity code for 3.2 that allowed us to detect any single limb fault and also showed competitive performances both in hardware and, and in software. Um, what we did not discuss about, but you can find more about that in, in the paper, is how to generalize our approach to larger codes. We also did not talk much about the authenticated encryption scheme, um, but it's discussed more in the, in the paper, um, as well as, for example, the cryptographic properties of the permutation, so diffusion, algebraic degree, but also linear and differential trails. Uh, in the paper, we also explain how, we, how FRIT can be adapted in order to address statistical ineffective fault attacks. So that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I invite you to um, ask them during the live presentation at Eurocrypt.